welcome to another episode of Talk Bigfoot. Uh, this will be episode five. Uh, I'm your host for tonight. Uh, I'm Jim Bradley, president of the IBRO. And, and tonight we have a special guest. We have uh, our vice president, uh, Ron, uh, a gentleman called Ron Madding, uh, from, all the way from Limerick in Ireland. I'm based in Dublin myself. Uh, Ron is based down in Limerick, which is a, a long, long way down the coast of Ireland on the far side of it. Next stop is the USA from where uh, Ron lives. Uh, Ron is uh, started off in the organization uh, only this time last year. Uh, we got involved in the uh, filming and the things of the documentary. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to Ron himself. He can tell you a little bit more about that, of uh, how he uh, got into the IBRO and his current status within the IBRO. Ron, welcome to Talk Bigfoot. Good evening, Jim. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Uh, we'll get straight into it and uh, get the guys uh, to know a little bit of your, of your background and what your current status is in the IBRO. Sure, yeah. Um, currently, I am the vice president uh, to you, Jim. Uh, I got involved with the IBRO back in, say, late October, early November last year. Um, basically, it was for my own, uh, uh, how would you say? Um, yes, Jim, uh, currently I am the vice president with the IBRO, uh, second to you. Um, I got involved late October early November last year when I was following up on information that we had say Bigfoot or Sasquatch in Ireland and at the time I wasn't of the belief of it so obviously I had to dig a little deeper to how would you say to fulfill my own uh, intentions at the time and I got chatting to you and as soon as I was talking to you, you had pointed me in the direction of the documentary that you had completed, which was just getting ready for release, I think, at the time. It was uh, Walking with the Wild Man. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I, I pur purchased uh, the documentary straight away. I hopped on it and it was... Uh, it's a good two hours long anyway. There was a lot of detail in it and there was a lot of reports in it. But the thing that stuck with me was the actual stuff that happened not so off camera. You still caught footage of it, but between shoots and when you were getting ready to get started. But uh, the, the grunts, the sounds that you got, um, the, the eye glow that you had, at Bracky Bog there um, was really intriguing to me and it just kind of spurred me on to to dig deeper as I say do you want know, to find out more and yeah yeah that's okay. where I tied in MHG with the uh, with original uh, investigations uh, but you can you can talk about that for a second there if you want because you and Chris were more in conversation about it at the time before I came on board yeah, uh, we initially uh, will will you know I'll ask you something uh, in a second now about uh, what got you into the subject initially, you know. Uh, but uh, just uh, you know, into a, a relation to what you just said there, the we uh, we what we found on part one of the documentary was uh, very intriguing, and because myself and Chris were there, we needed an independent uh, witness to investigate it with us. So. You kindly stepped up to the mark, and we invited you on to uh, have a go at investigating. It seemed as you you were the only one that you know you weren't there, and we were there, so it was only fair we get someone from the outside. Um, and plus, you at the time you were in the IBRO, uh, one of the members at the time, but um, that's why you were initially asked to come in and and, and uh, have a go at investigating it. But just to get back to uh, what got you into the subject initially, Ron, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it would have been going back, say, 2012, 2014, I'd say. 
I was actually watching a documentary on the National Geographic channel and it was called, uh, it was, was um, footage with the Memorial Day footage. Yeah. I don't know if you remember it. I it do was, indeed, uh, yeah. Yep. I think there was two families that were out camping or having a barbecue and they spotted this figure running across the hillside in front of them and it was running at an astounding rate and the amount of ground they covered in so little time uh, and the size of it obviously as well and it was a dark figure all covered in dark brown I think closer to black but uh, it led them to believe that it was a, a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch so basically the documentary that I was watching had a couple of uh, experts in different fields, you'd say. You wouldn't say experts in Bigfoot or Sasquatch because we don't have any. Yeah, but, that's true. Yep. Um, they took out Dr. Jeff Meldrum was there and they took out a professional athlete, a runner, and one or two other specialists in electronics, you know, for recording speed and yep. trajectory and everything like that. So basically they had this runner run across the terrain where the figure had run and as quick as he could he couldn't cover the ground and he was a professional runner so yeah. for me that stuck out straight away because it's it's in black and white for me it's right in front of you a professional runner couldn't run that terrain he said it was impossible to do it yeah. in the time that it was done so i i classes that as a you know a real-time uh, incident uh, you yeah. know a real 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 things happening there's no things disappearing or disappearing with a lights bolt of lightning or whatever you want to call it you know this is a real actual flesh and blood thing running yeah. so that that piqued my interest straight away now it kind of died off a small bit at the time after that you know it was just it struck in my mind and it was always in the back of my mind but a couple of years later um, my two boys were sitting out watching Finding Bigfoot, which is fairly popular. Yeah. And they they were like, Dad, sit down and watch this. So basically, you'd sit down and you'd watch the programs with them. And the memory then was coming back of this documentary I'd seen a few years previous. And of course, we were sitting in, we'd watch one show and then a second show would come on. So we were, we were binge watching before long. And we were yeah. watching it into a couple of seasons, but whatever about the guys researching, um, like a lot of knowledge comes to comes to the four years on, like the likes of Bobo and Cliff would tell you the way the thing was being directed as such, you know, so uh, they couldn't get their full say on what to do. But the, the interesting thing for me was uh, the reports and listening to the people and their reports at the town hall meetings you know yeah. so yeah like these are people up the street coming in giving their reports which kind of brought me back then to your documentary when you were reenacting reports that you had got in over the, the the coming years you know yeah so that kind of tied me in then and made me want to to branch out a bit more so to speak. Yeah. So that that's kind of where I was coming from. So I, when watching them, I started watching more documentaries. And uh, YouTube is a great platform for footage and also for hoaxes as well. That's true. I, yeah. yeah, I've seen plenty of hoaxes in my my few years. Uh, I would just say couch researching, as I yeah. hadn't got boots in the ground at the time. But I would be the one that would uh, troll researchers as such you know but uh, yeah. I, I watched a lot of footage where for myself I could see something in a physical being that would look like a man or move like a man and other instances then where you could see it would move like an ape or sound like an ape or you know vocalizations etc because my yeah. my original thought was that these are an undiscovered uh, species of primate and that's why I kind of clung on to Jeff Meldrum's theories, you know, with his footprints, et cetera, that, you know, that he, he maintains that it's a, it's a species of primate. Yeah. So that's what, yeah. it, that's what you believe, uh, uh, Ron, as well, is it? That they're, they're, well, they're that an arm of the primate? 
there originally, yeah. yeah. Um, just in the last year, uh, just listening to more people's reports and stuff and eyewitness reports, I'm swaying in an opposite direction as such. But look, there's, there's many types out there we can split hairs over it as such. What, what is actually out there, everybody has their beliefs. Yeah. Uh, but look, I think there there is a kind of a strain there that that is t- towards primate, yeah. And there's other strains then which we which I think we have in Europe and Ireland as well, which would push towards more of a Neanderthal or ancient man or wild man. But we can get onto that anyways in a few minutes. Yeah, just if anything, uh, that uh, finding Bigfoot, uh, the show over the years, if it did anything, it brought uh, the subject to the fore and to the masses around the world. It, it's, uh, it brought the subject to light. People became more aware of it that didn't, never knew anything about it. That it did do, I have to say, in leaps and bounds. But uh, um, as I said, another, uh, just to getting on to, back to my questions there. Um, what exactly are your thoughts on what, uh, on what is habit, you know, in, in, in Ireland, you know, habitating Ireland and Europe in its, do you do you think it's a particular branch of a species? It's your own thoughts on that. Um, look at the moment from research in the last few months, I've I've actually covered a lot of ground. I could say personally, in the last six months, I feel kind of privileged in a way. And I made a comment on another uh, podcast saying that I was kind of a, in a way, classed as a like a, a cheater, a fraud for the amount of. Uh, activity I've got in the last year you know yeah like you have you have researchers in America and Canada that could be out researching for two years and they wouldn't get anything yeah yeah you know and like I'm here I say in my first outing with boots on the ground and I got two two separate accounts of activity yeah you know that's a Joe, so you'd be doing a lot of numbers after that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I have to say, I was with you. I was with you at the time, and uh, I can vouch for that 100%. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but going on currently, I I think we have a wood roost in Ireland, uh, which is kind of, it, you can link it to the European wild men and the sightings across Europe, which is more like, it's around seven feet tall, maybe up to nine feet, but I haven't heard many reports of over eight feet. Yeah. Uh, closer around to the Neanderthal type, so people would have reports of seeing them and they're saying it looked almost human. Yeah. Now, this, uh, you know, this time six months ago, Ron, did you ever believe that there was uh, you know, Sasquatch-like creatures here in Ireland itself? Well, not a, you could go back a bit further. Uh, That's true, six yeah. months, six months would be a bit short. Uh, yeah. Back at the time when I made contact with you first, yeah, uh, I didn't believe it. No, I, I thought, uh, I thought the island was too small. Uh, something of that size, um, would need a lot of calories, you know. So yeah. that would be a lot of food, uh, you know, to sustain uh, a creature of that size. Yeah, and yeah. I just, t- I didn't think. Uh, We'd have anything here for it, but like yourself, you you have a lot of experience with with deer, etc., and and wildlife, and speaking to one or two friends who were experienced hunters also, and they're telling me, listen, five kilometers from your home, there's an abundance of deer in those woods. You don't see them. Yeah, and it's true. I've been out there many times, and I don't see them. I've seen deer once, I'd say on the opposite side of my city and yeah. that's when I was parked up whereas just last week I was out in another forest and straight away I was cycling through and I was picking up deer like that loads of deer like yeah you know so that that just cements my theory yeah. anyway that we can't sustain such a creature and we have because I have evidence of it <laughs> yeah I do believe Ron that before we we ever met that you were uh, preparing to to uh, how would you say travel overseas to do a bit of research there yourself? Yeah, I was. I have a I have a sister in the states. Um, she'd be up in 
the northeast, so up before Boston, you know, in Maine. Uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of reports coming out of there. Uh, that was one thought. Uh, my second thought with them was actually to travel over just to Scotland, around Ben Nevin, and the, there's another mountain range there with loads of reports of uh, yeah. the big grey man. Big grey man is there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And even just listening to a few reports of the big grey man, etc., uh, there's actually more than grey ones spotted around yeah. those areas over yeah. the years, and by doctors as well, and experienced hikers have all reported it. And yeah. we have reports here in Ireland of the big grey man as well. Yeah. Now, I don't personally, uh, I know you have, and Chris has uh, as well, and I think Chris has a bit more information, but like you've had your experiences too. So, That's correct, yeah. yeah. You know, so um, like they are here and we have on this island, I am 100% convinced that we have two types. We have a wood roost and we have a Bigfoot. You can call him the Irish Bigfoot or the Grey Man. Like, you can give him all the names you like, but that's what we have, I think. Yeah, given given the location, uh, the you know the geographic location of Ireland, do you think that people are going to say, "How is the Bigfoot in Ireland? How can they get here? How can you know what I mean? They're, they're, you're on an island away from away from Europe. Uh, can yeah. you explain, you know, in in any detail how they would have got here? They've always been here, Jim, is my thought. Um, a couple of thousand years ago, Ireland was connected to the UK, which was also connected to Europe, and there was one big land bridge there that came in. Yeah. Like, if you think about it, uh, the way the, the world is at the moment, uh, we are discovering fossils and, how would you say, skeletons of Neanderthals and other ancient animals that were inhabiting the earth thousands of years ago from the ice melting. So yeah. that would yeah. give you a, a kind of a time scale of when these were habituating the, the world. Uh, we actually have found uh, fossils of woolly mammoths in Ireland. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, and up to, I could be wrong on timing, but within the last thousand years, we've had brown bear, uh, wolves, uh, giant stags on this island as well. And that yeah. was when Ireland was an island because Ireland was covered in forest, literally yeah. covered in forest. Yeah. Uh, and reports of wild men in Ireland go back, you can go back three, four hundred years. Uh, like I have a report from 10 minutes from where I live now of a wild man which is, it was reported actually 100 years ago and the area was all forest in and it was uh, running off the Shannon River. Now the Shannon flows all the way up through Ireland. Yeah. And places we have done uh, research this year are all basically working off the River Shannon onto locks. And you know, that's, that's true, the documentary that we're filming for part two. So, what we're going to cover um, on locks and reports and investigations that we have done this year will all be covered in Walking with the Wild Men too, uh, the Woodwoos. So um, that'll be for another conversation anyway. But we'll we'll move on. Yeah, the uh, just to let the, uh, what the listeners know that uh, these sightings that uh, Ron is talking about, they, 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 you know, they're not nothing new. It's not new. This is going back to medieval times going way back over, some of them over a thousand years ago, uh, stories of uh, different, uh, they've Kel the Celts have different names for them, the Vikings had different names for them, but uh, all uh, describing similar creatures. Uh, somebody used to come and uh, take the women, grab the women from the from the villages and run into the woods and all that, and this is when Ireland was uh, from north to south, it was a massive big oak forest, you know, uh, Ireland was well known for its uh, for his trees, um, England used to uh, get a lot of its uh, timber here from uh, for shipbuilding in the uh, medieval times, and that from Ireland. But uh, yeah, just to let the listeners yeah. know that it's uh, it's nothing new. It's not something new on this end. This end. But, no, uh, uh, but like even doing a small bit of research myself on Europe, um, I've had reports, say, or old stories or tales. Even you could go go on 
um, and they're all they all depict the same thing a wild yeah. hairy man living in the woods you know yeah yeah um, the you're talking well, I read one story there of one that was captured in like 1660 in around Lithuania yeah and they actually captured this wild man and I think the other name they gave it was a man bear what do you wow. call them as well? Yeah. And the one that was captured in Lithuania, they actually gave it to the, the Queen of Poland at the time uh, wow. as a gift. And wow. apparently uh, the, she she taught it basic commands <laughs> at the oh. time. Uh, yeah, but like you can you can go on to like the Greeks and the Romans have have old reports uh, of seeing them when when the Romans were coming conquering Europe. Um, where else? Where else are the reports? Um, there was other few going across over towards the Middle East of uh, wild men, you know, in the Gobi Desert and everything. Yeah, yeah. Going across over that way, and of course we have our reports coming from uh, American soldiers out of Afghanistan. Do you know about the giant men? Yeah. You know, in the caves, those yeah, stories, yeah. like you know, like well, you could say the wild men would have been a smaller version, but as you go on into the Middle East and you have stories of these giants, yeah, you know, they're, they're yeah, 12, they're 15 bigger. foot tall, you know, they're getting bigger, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but all that area, like you can head over towards uh, Mongolia, there was reports there that go down into China then as well. And you have the yeah. Aaron Pendig and the Aaron, you know, down that way. So, yeah. And you have the Yeti then as you go further north into yeah. Siberia and Russia. So, yeah. like, it's a world, just, worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah. It's and worldwide. it's just, just some of the stories from the wild men linking up, say from Europe going across. But yeah. even going on, going on uh, current reports and uh, witness reports in the last, say, 10, 15 years, you have countries like Finland, France, Scotland, England, we know of anyway. You have reports yeah. out of Germany. I have uh, people on the, the, the private uh, Bigfoot Britain and Ireland page reports from Italy uh, I got one from Sweden of a guy he was uh, going out to his sauna he had his sauna set up did you hear that one I didn't actually know uh, he had a sauna an outdoor sauna so he, he went out and he had the sauna heating up so he went back into the house and he's, it was a really cold day and the, the snow was actually frozen hard That uh, so he was in the house and he looked out and you could see the door of his sauna was open a jar and he locked it and out of the corner, he was there. He caught two figures slouched over, kind of Neanderthal type, uh, wow. walking away from it. And that was over in Sweden only a few years ago. Wow, amazing! Uh, yeah, so like, there's loads of reports going across Europe. Yeah, we'll get into uh, some of your personal um, experiences, Ron. If you want to go through a few of those. Yeah, well, I've I've had a few. A few I can't talk about because we were actually on film with yeah. it for the new documentary. Yeah, uh, that, that's coming out in December, by the way, for anyone yeah. listening. <laughs> Get right. plug in there. But yeah, uh, yeah like my first day uh, when I met up with you guys for filming for the start of the documentary, uh, these are the things I can talk about because they weren't actually on film at the time. Yeah. But, uh, but you were a witness there to it yourself that day. But if you look at it from my perspective, I was a little skeptic when I met up with you. Mm. Um, we went down and we were doing the introductory uh, filming so like I I was standing up and you were filming away doing your bits and pieces so we had took us about an hour to get the, the lighting right etc and get the lines and everything but at that stage we had a bit of travelling done so we said we'd sit down for a bit of food so yeah. we went over uh, actually I, I think I did my independent investigation of your eye glow, did I? Before that. You, you think you did, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, I, I spent a good hour at it, and I I won't go into too much about it, but I, I did a good survey of the area as well, and uh, just my own my own experience there, that uh, that terrain is almost impossible to manoeuvre. Yeah. And I'd be, I'd be fairly, well, I was fairly fit and athletic, athletical at the time, so, you know, climbing, climbing over obstacles wouldn't be much of an issue for me. Yeah. But, uh, but moving on anyway to 
my my first experience. Um, myself and Ben, the cameraman, were bringing some excess equipment back to the cars that we weren't going to need for the afternoon shooting, you know, like tripods and stuff. So we headed back to the car. And on the way back, uh, like that was the first time I met Ben. So we were just having some like chat and conversation on the way back. And you two guys were sitting down. You had an old uh, screen set out on the ground, you know, setting up lunch, having a bit of soup and coffee and stuff. And uh, we were chatting along in a way. And we looked down to you and we were coming down a small bit of a slope. And all of a sudden you stood up and put your hand up and told us to stop. And when you did that, we stopped talking. And I could catch the end of a, like a, a groan or, or a, like a moan or something. Yeah. And the next thing in of it, it just started again. And the sound of it uh, was only described as uh, amazing. Uh, I've never heard anything like it in my life. Uh, you could nearly, it started off as a high pitch. It was like a scream like a, a very loud scream that bellowed down to a deeper kind of a wail. But it it must have lasted about 20 or 30 seconds, I'd say. Yeah. And yeah. In, in all, it would it would sound like a, like a donkey at one stage. You know, if you get that kind of a sound, but a donkey wouldn't hold, he couldn't hold it for very long and he'd change and he'd go hoarse and go, ah. But yeah, if he yeah. didn't go like that at all, it was just a constant wail for 30 seconds. And yeah. straight away, I said to myself, uh, what could hold that such power and noise for so long? Yeah, like, the lung, yeah, uh, the uh, lung capacity. The lung capacity, yeah. I was just gonna say, yeah, and it was, it was or, yeah, like I'd be, I play music myself, and I know all about lung capacity and what the lungs can do, and even listen to re uh, recordings of deer and stags no one deer giving out howls and stuff and yeah. nothing could match this and straight away i said to you i shouted down to you i hope you have that recorded <laughs> yeah we're just having our sandwiches now obviously you didn't you were stuck on the ground eating yeah yeah but, uh, but yeah that was my first one uh so that kind of pepped up spirits and it it kind of uh, it opened my eyes a bit straight away but uh i had a second uh how would you call incident then in the afternoon when we were doing uh, some calls over and back for filament yeah. yeah. and myself and yourself, we actually went up to the spot where the 2017 report was, where the the witness was actually stood face to face with one. And yeah. it, was it within 10 feet of one, was it? It was actually nearly face to face, to be honest. Yeah, it was, uh, it, I think it three stepped feet, up behind yeah. it, was it? Yeah, yeah it stepped yeah, up behind yeah. it onto the, the old wooden platforms that they had there. Yeah, uh, it was an old disused bog. The area was, and they had platforms there that you could walk through. Because uh, uh, I think that bog links off onto some kind of a trail there, going on yeah. further on. But uh, but enough about the report anyway. But that's where we were, and so myself and yourself, Jim, were were standing up on the trail, and Chris and Ben, the cameraman, were I think it was like a kilometer away down the other side of the the, the bog. Yeah. And, Chris was actually starting to do some calls. So Chris had done a call first and he got choked up and he cut out like two seconds into it and he radioed back to us and told us and he was laughing and Ben, the cameraman, was making fun of him as well. But we yeah. were actually filming at the time as well because we were recording for the documentary. Yeah. But we had our camera pointed back towards Chris's direction. Mm -hmm. So we had radio back and we, we, we were... We were timing the call, so Chris said he was doing a call in ten. So Chris did another call, and he got a good, a good bellow out. And literally two seconds later, there was a second call, and it came from our opposite direction. Yeah. And straight away, I looked at you and I said, "Did you hear that?" And you said, "Yeah, I heard that." And we were on the radio straight away to Chris, saying, "Chris, did you do a second call uh, after the first one?" And he said. No, just the one. And we, we radio back a second time just to confirm it. And he said, no, I just did the one call. Now, obviously, the direction that we heard the second call from would have been further away from Chris, so Chris didn't pick it up. Yeah. But unfortunately, the way the camera was pointing, I think there's directional mics on them 
That's correct, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it didn't actually pick it up, but that was the second one for, for me, like, so. Yeah, um, that, er that area was uh, was dead flat as well. There's no uh, mountains for echoes or anything like that, so it was a uh, flat ground, and we got it. That was an instant you know, response. We got a call back. It was further on behind us, and as you said, we, we did ask Chris, was he there? You know, did he call again? And he didn't. But uh, that was we we got him to call a couple of times after that, but we didn't hear anything else. It was just that you know initial one time that we heard it. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, um, it's kind of I I think personally, if you if you do a call and you get a reply from it, I don't think you're going to get a second one. No, that's that's my belief anyway because uh, I I think they're they're too smart. Yeah, Ron, there was a few other times that we went out by ourselves, not filming, just doing a bit of squatching, nighttime squatching in the pitch black. Um, you want to tell us a couple of incidents maybe that happened during those? Yeah, uh, that, that was uh, a bit more eerie for me because uh, one of the times that we went to a good hotspot that Chris frequents and Chris has had a few hairy moments there himself and... Of course, that was put me on edge straight away after after what I had got previous, you know, with the, the vocalizations that we had got. And Chris had said that this area was a small bit more, I would just say, aggressive or they were a yeah. bit more bold. Yeah. Uh, but we went in and it was purely for uh, our own purposes. There was no filming or anything that night. And you had a laser with you, uh, a high powered laser. And I just had a small flashlight, which was all, all the world good to me. Mm. But uh, even straight away, five minutes in, we, we were walking through these woods and I seen uh, this kind of a structure. Uh, you could say there was like a 15 foot. It wasn't as big as a beam now, but it would have been like maybe at the thickest point, uh, six inches in diameter. So it was a fairly thick branch. Yeah, and it was 15 feet long. And that was lodged up in two other trees, about twenty feet in the air. But it was it was pointing straight. It was horizontal, but the top of it was resting in to a kind of a little fork on another branch. Yeah. Which, which means it was placed there. Yeah. You know, nobody goes out into the middle of the woods and picks up a, a twenty foot branch and places it there. You know, what would yeah. you be at? You know. Yeah. But uh, we we ventured on a small bit more, but. Uh, the amount of movement around us, uh, it was, I, I was uneasy that night. I was, it was the one time I really felt on edge and it was a different kind of a feeling. Like you get adrenaline rushes and stuff, but I just got that feeling that night that we weren't, we weren't wanted there. Um, you know, you, you don't often get that feeling. Like, you know, I, I, I get a sense, I can, I can read, uh, body language and say dogs and such. I know when a dog is nervous, uh, like I've had dogs on my life, you get to read body language, but when you get something that's telling you that you're not wanted there and you can't see what's telling you is, yeah. is eerie, you know? Uh, yeah. And all the heavy movement going through the brush there, like it wasn't a badger or a fox there, you know? Yeah, there was that same location, uh, myself and Chris, and another friend of Chris's was there at the time. Uh, we were not filming. We just went out uh, doing a bit of squatching at night. And uh, the Chris and his friend were up ahead of me, about maybe 50, 60 yards ahead. And I was behind, lagging behind deliberately just to see what's ending, watching, or, you know, just to see. It was absolutely pitch black. That place, you know, As you know, Ron, that place is... Yeah. Uh, and there's, you know, over here in Ireland, we, we, we don't have crickets or anything that makes... Uh, noises like that at uh, nighttime noise we, it's deadly it's deathly quiet there's not a sound to be heard but uh chris uh what decided to let out a call and when he let out let out the call he immediately turned to his friend and was talking to him and he didn't hear what i heard uh it sounded like uh like a car like a, a car uh, going through the forest uh about 150 yards up the side of the hill it was going up and away crash bang smash it was uh it only happened for a second or two, but uh, I asked Chris, did he hear it? He said he didn't because he was talking, but I definitely he heard it. And I yeah. had pin, I had pinpointed it with the, uh, with, you know, with the flashlight and uh, where it was. But uh, we didn't, 
we decided not to venture up there. It got very, very dense, very tight. And uh, I think we went in so far, you know, into an, a certain area, not not within 100 yards, 200 yards. Or, and we actually got lost. We couldn't find our way back out. It took us a while to get out. Uh, as you know, how tight and how dense you get, you get turned around in there and you just don't know where you are, you know? Yeah, it was uh, very, I, I'm i not a claustrophobic person, but I felt it in there that night. Uh, but another thing that was in my mind is going on, Joe, your own, uh, your own experience there that uh, you actually did a, a podcast with Vic Condiff, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, and I had I had heard that podcast, and that was kind of sticking in my mind as well at the time. You know, your experiences, like without yeah. actually telling you uh, that I had heard it, because yeah, I I didn't tell you at the time that I actually heard that podcast. Yeah, that I was up there full in the knowledge of what uh, he had yeah. experienced. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, like this is this. But is I still place. had to open it up in mind, if you know what I mean. You know. Yeah. This is the place where it happened, like where you were listening yeah, to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of surreal as well, you know. Mm. The, uh, your personal thoughts over the last six months, uh, Ron, what has changed and what has what, what has happened in the last six months overall? Um, well, I'm, as I said already, I'm, I'm 100% certain what we have in this island. Uh, anybody that doesn't uh, believe or think as much, they're... They're just blocking off. They're not looking at the real evidence that we have. And every bit of evidence that we have here now that we've even mustered up in the last six months are on a par with anything you would get in America or even Canada. Yep. You know, that's, that's being honest. Like, we have, I think, we have 30 different uh, footprint tracks and maybe two, two I would rule out anyway straight away. Uh, yeah, I think you're on the same thinking. Yeah, uh, and some of those have been submitted, and some you've got yourselves over the last uh, eighteen months, two years. Uh, yeah, in the last few months, I've found structures. Um, I've I've got my own vocalizations now at this stage, uh, prints, and you know we we have we have stuff on film. And I can't go any further on that neither, but that's another reason why to tell people to watch out for the documentaries. You know, ye have footage already, ye of Iglo. Uh, yeah. Ye have, ye actually have a vocalization as well, don't you, on that part one? When uh, you were, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, we, do, uh, you, were, uh, you were doing right. a test shot for the, the ghillie suit, John, for that's the right, reenactment. Yeah. You yeah. got a grunt. Uh, yeah, yeah, so like that stuff is there already. Like people are crying out for that kind of stuff in America. You know, yeah. If you've seen uh, part one, we uh, you know we can talk about um, the um, myself and Chris were, were were in shot and we were we were filming in in uh, with you know infrared camera. Uh, it was pitch dark. We could see nothing. It was black dark, and we were just chatting away about this uh, sequence and what was the only the area in general. And I was chatting, and over my shoulder was uh, appeared. Uh, which we didn't see at the time. It was only when we sat down and recapped over the whole thing that we, uh, not two or three feet behind me, was a single eye, single eye glow, uh, which uh, shows up on camera. And then uh, within the next two minutes or so of uh, footage, uh, there's a pair of eyes behind me, uh, not the, I'd say 30, 25, 30 feet behind me. Would that be correct, Ron? Yeah, well, I don't want to say too much on that neither, but uh, that would yeah. be close enough because I actually did, a, at the time, an independent investigation on that place. Yeah. And, like, going back to myself, like, I'm a realist. You know, nothing yeah. dropped in there in a parachute and nothing swam out of the place. So yeah. there was actually something physical in there. And yeah. you know, that, that pushes on to my personal thoughts and beliefs where I'm at now at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, like we we can't say any more on the investigation either because yeah, it's, actually on, yeah. it's on film now, so yeah. um, it's all there to see, you know, when it comes out. Um, I I think I did a fair enough job on it, and yeah, I did enough to convince myself, and I just hope I can convince other people as well. But uh, yeah, that remains to see. But but going on where I am now, I I'm still 
of the belief that it's a flesh and blood creature. Now, yeah. you have variations of them all over the world, like Dioi in Australia. Uh, I was only talking to a chap a couple of days ago on Facebook. He's in New Zealand and ancient stories come back you know, from the Maori tribes. Uh, yeah. They picked an ancient wild man there as well. But New Zealand is an island, so nobody will entertain it. But you know, more and more stories will come out of there soon enough once more and more people uh, catch on to the subject. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like you go down around Asia, you have like sightings of five foot creatures, six foot creatures, uh, all the stories from American soldiers and Canadian soldiers going over fighting in Vietnam in the 60s. Uh, you know, stories of the, the rock monkeys, they call them, is it? Uh, yeah, uh, oh no, uh, sorry, rock apes, yeah. Rock apes, yeah, yeah. Uh, guys actually, there was actually platoons actually fighting against them at some stage and saying, they're, they're emptying full clips out of their M16s and they couldn't hit them because they were moving so quick, yet they were still yeah. getting hit by rocks and stuff, you know. Uh, yeah. But like some amazing stories, like. Uh, yeah. But going on what, what I believe, I think we have, we have clusters and I get more reports from down, down in the, the, the Midlands and in the Midwest, go over towards the Burn and County Clare, uh, up around that lawn. And Lincoln, like there's a lot of forest there going from, if you look at Loch Derg on, on Google Maps and just go west of it for 30, 40 miles, there's all forest there and it's all joining up. And yeah. it's going all the way up the Midlands, up to Monaghan and up into the north. And there's over 100 miles of forest. Now think of Ireland, the size of Ireland. Yeah. And you put 100 miles of forest up through it. That's a lot of forest like. Yeah. And we're not yeah, even yeah. talking about what's over in the the northeast, you know, up around the more mountains and all the yeah. reports that come out of there. That that's yeah. another area altogether. And you've got yeah. you've got plenty of joy over in the, the east of Ireland, you know, say the Cooley yeah. Mountains and up into the more mountains. They're yeah. all joined up like, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. my belief is we have wood woos in Ireland. Um uh, I I from going by footprints, like they're they're a shorter footprint, but they're a lot wider. Uh, I, to me, like a wood was, if you think of it as in human terms, would be a power lifter. They're a lot sturdier, a lot stronger, but they're they're smaller, and I think they're they're of a stronger build. Whereas the Irish Bigfoot would be between eight and ten foot tall, yeah, which would be a lot taller. But look, you can say they're equally as strong, but I think they would be more of a, you wouldn't say aggressive type, but a lot more cheeky. And I think they would, they would make a lot more structures and mark their territory a lot more. Yeah. Uh, I think they live in clans. So they're living kind of family groups. I call them clans. Yeah. Uh, going, I'm not sure, not too sure on the wood roots, how you could separate them, but going on stories from, if you go switch over to the primal side of things, like the reports of gorillas giving out a, not a pheromone, but giving out a smell, you know, when they're intimidated or when they get agitated. Yeah. And you hear their reports of Bigfoot say, you know, there's people saying there's a horrible smell. Uh, oh. I know Chris got an awful stench um, the other night while he was doing a live feed in, in his area, which is mainly... A Woodwoo's territory, but as he said, uh, the big grey man was spotted there in the yeah. last two years. There was five reports. Mm -hmm. So, like, has the Bigfoot clan moved in there? We don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another another thing with them is uh, this infrasound, and you have your experience of that, I think, anyway. I think you've experienced it the other night. Yeah. Uh, Chris has before, but the likes of the, the game cameras that people set up like they're saying why can't why can't we catch them on film you know why can't we film them why don't the game cams catch them but i think it's all with the the, the infrared lights yeah I, I think they see them and yeah. they stay clear of them hmm. uh i've i've heard stories of um there was one famous one in satchel's chronicles where a guy was 
getting a lot of activity around his home and he set up cameras all around it. Do you remember that? Yeah. And for a finish, he, he found markers on where the limits of the sensors were picking up movement. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I think they see all this, you know, I think they're very intelligent. They have a big brain. So yeah. like electronics is very hard thing. Like you get reports of people with their batteries going dead or whatever. Uh, they move so quick, it's very hard to actually take a picture of them. Yeah. You you try taking a picture of something moving at 40 miles an hour that's 100 yards away from you. Yeah. Like yeah. you're not going to get it unless you you have a camera set up and ready for it. But yeah. if someone, the best mobile phones today have unbelievable cameras, but movement is not one thing they're very good at. People yeah. don't realize that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. To catch it on film, like they see you coming before you see them nine times out of ten. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very rare that you'd walk upon one. Uh, it does happen, you know. You could be, you could be walking, uh, say downwind or upwind, sorry, and they could be drinking water, or they could be stalking their prey. Like deer hunters come across them, deer's deer would run into a hunter's area, and all of a sudden the deer's are running towards the hunter up in his stand, and you know <laughs> they're 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 wondering. What are they doing running towards me? Yet yeah. they look into the bush and they see something or they hear a big growl and yeah. there's a big foot over there chasing <laughs> them. So like, you know, these these stories have happened. Like hunters, deer hunters would be sitting up in their up in their stands and they could be there four hours and they see a deer running down. Like I, I think when a when when hunters set up a deer stand, do they have a clear vision in front of them? There's no woods directly in front of them. Would that be right? Some of the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have a kill area, like you have an yeah, area where it's where an open area. Open it's an open area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've heard one or two reports of deer coming out into that area and actually a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch coming out onto the area, chasing the deer down, catching it and killing it. Yeah. I've heard one or two reports of that. Have you? I have in the States, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Literally, they'd run a deer down and they'd catch it and just snap its neck immediately and kill it. I've heard one or two reports where they've they've killed a big deer and it might be fairly heavy and they literally catch the legs and split them and tear it in half and take yeah. half the carcass. Yeah. I've heard other reports where they catch the full carcass and throw it over the shoulder and mock off at it. Mm. Uh, but look, there. That's that's where I'm at at the moment. Uh, yeah. I'm on the flesh and blood thing. I I don't I can't dismiss people's reports and what to witness. Uh, not onto cloaking. I know a few of our friends have witnessed them being almost to the point of being transparent. Yeah. And uh, the, some people might call it cloaking, you know, like the Predator movie. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, other than that, I, I just think they move so quick and so fast Yeah. that um, one minute you see them and the next minute, you could, with a blink of an eye, they can leap and leap so powerfully that I've I've heard reports of them leaping ten yards of one stride. Yeah. So what's to say they've leapt ten yards of one stride and out of view? Yeah. And start to disappear in front yeah. of your eyes. Yeah. So we don't know. Like people could be out in the woods eating magic mushrooms and the UFO comes over and picks them up and takes them home. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> True. There, yeah. there is these stories out there. Like yeah. You know, you, there's no there's no denying it, but you can't yeah. dismiss them neither. Like. If that if that is the case with with all the links with UFOs, uh, what's to say that the UFOs are not coming down and studying them as well? Yeah, the um, just another one there, uh, Ron. The, your ideas on research itself. Uh, research, I think. Look, a lot of reports are people that are out hiking or they're out walking their dog or like people out jogging. Uh, I I think we, you hear reports going through the years where you have uh, abductions and women being kidnapped from villages. You know, going back to the Native Indians in America, yeah, there was a lot of reports of women being abducted. And I think you could get down to, wouldn't say dominant male, but maybe uh, a male in the, the clan that's coming of age and probably you know, like a big juvenile. Yeah. And, they 
they're very sensitive, so they'll pick up the pheromones from females, you know. Yeah. And you hear reports of them juveniles coming along and watching, like uh, women, you know, like at houses, yep. you know, mm-hmm. and uh, they're watching them and maybe they're kidnapping them, and you know, um, it's, you know, I, I think it is it is a thing as well, and that's that's kind of one thing I wanted to try uh, when we were doing our research was actually trying uh, women's perfume and spraying it on trees as yeah. we were going along. So uh, that, that'd be one idea. Now we did, we did a few new things uh, while we were filming as well. But mm-hmm. look, going on wood knocks, I think only worked to an extent. I think, personally, I think wood knocks are actually knocks from the watcher during the daytime. And the watcher is actually giving out a signal back to the clan of maybe the amount yeah. of people that he sees, like yeah. two knocks or three knocks, three people. Mm-hmm. I could be proven wrong, but look, that's yeah. what I think. I think knocks are are their signals back to the clan. So when people give a knock out, I think the the watcher is actually knocking back to the clan, and maybe the clan is knocking back to him. Now I might yeah. be wrong on that, but I I can't believe that people can go out and actually do three knocks and get three knocks back over mm-hmm. and back constantly. Yeah. Um, uh, what else? I, I think if if a watcher was closer, uh, I've actually heard one person put the suggestion forward that because they are so big and they have big heads and they have a big mouth that maybe they're doing a pop with their finger. Yeah. Popping, you know, popping the side of their mouth. Making yeah. a popping sound, but they're so big that it actually sound like it's it's a bang, and I I also think that it's not always three knocks neither. I think they actually bang the ground like gorillas. Yeah, gorillas do that in a I know is it a territorial marking or a sign of uh, dominance. You know, so maybe if somebody walks in into like an area. That maybe they're banging on the ground as well. Yeah, yeah. No, but as I say already, we have no experts in this, and they're all theories. Pe- True. So people have witnessed things, but it could have been an isolated incident what they've witnessed, and it doesn't yeah. count for all other, uh, all other experiences. You know. Yeah. There's just one more thing, Ron, before we wrap up. Uh, your future plans. What have you got lined up for? the say coming year um basically where i'm at now at the moment uh by the end of the year personally i want to if not catch one a film i want to see one with my own eyes and i think i will we have we have three three good areas that we have researched that have given us very uh good optimism and we've got good, uh, good reports out of it, and we've, you know, we've we've been successful there. Um, I'm going to go back there again within the year, so by the end of December, I want to actually witness seeing one myself. Uh, the other thing in the pipeline is the new documentary uh, that I actually jumped on board for for the rest of, and I yeah. was privileged to be asked by yourselves. To be a part of it and it's a big thing for me as well to be part of and when it comes out i just i hope it uh broadens people's horizons and yeah. other people that are not uh actively following you know bigfoot groups i know there's people out there and i know there's people in my city uh that are on bigfoot groups but still don't believe that we can host a creature in ireland yeah and yeah. they are there. I, I've seen them comment and I've, I've seen bits and that's another thing I want to do. I want to change their minds or make them, make them think, you know, yeah. put, put the thought in their brain and let them say, well, maybe he's 50% right. And let them see for themselves then if they yeah. want to, if they want to contact me, I can send them on information if they want to come out and go researching. I'd gladly take them out. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, that's what I want. Um, and then being part of the, the Irish Bigfoot Research Organization. Uh, the last the last eight months have been kind of a whirlwind for me in that aspect also. Um, yeah. I'd love to see the, the, how would you say, the group, the organization be more recognized and hopefully a lot more Americans will, will catch on to the organization and support us in our research. Yeah. And, you know, uh, maybe next year we might get invited over to the Pacific Northwest or somewhere for uh, a town hall meeting or you know, a convention or something. And yeah. we get to shoulders with some of the Americans over and pass on our experiences with them as well. Because some, are, some of our experiences and research and our evidence is pretty similar, you know, so yeah. it would be great to touch base and that would be an excellent thing to happen. So if there's anyone out there listening that wants to fund us <laughs> and fly us over, I'd <laughs> gladly hop in the plane or just bring us over to research even for a week. I'd yeah. gladly do it. Or even Canada. Canada is fantastic as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but like more or less, that's what, that's where I'm at at the moment. Uh, and we have, we have a group of people here now that have hopped on in the last few months and I've got people coming to me like every two weeks with scratching their heads, asking, what is this? What is that? What could it be? And could we actually have them here? And yeah, the answer I have is they are here, you know, and yeah. just uh, broaden your mind a small bit, open up and don't be so closed off to things. So you know, just because someone says they're not there doesn't mean they're not. As again, you said they were here. I had to prove for myself, you know, and a one comment that stood out to me um, over the the last few months of listening to other people and researchers is a comment by Andy McGrath. I don't know if you heard of him from America. Uh, he wrote a book, Beast of Britain. If you remember the the book Beast of Britain, I don't know if you've heard of it, Jim. Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah. It was written by Andy McGrath, and there was one comment that stood out for me he, from him when he was talking about it. And he actually said, for researchers today, we need to look past footprints and structures and go further in and actually look for these things. Do you yeah. understand what he's saying? Yeah, I do indeed. You get some researchers, they're just going out and they're taking pictures of structures all the time and footprints, and they're just going back then and reporting that. You know. Uh, yeah. It's a thing that stuck out for me. I think w we have to push it on, and other researchers do as well. You know, you can't yeah. just sit down and look at the structures all the time. Oh, that's Bigfoot. Yeah, that's Bigfoot. Yeah. That's Bigfoot in a tree. Like you're going on to the pareidolia thing. Um, you know, we we need to get past that. And yeah. it's a thing that it kind of annoys me also as people sticking up pictures, you know, and saying, "Can you see what I'm looking at?" You know, and you're looking at bushes. Yeah. No, there's no saying that there was probably a Sasquatch in the bushes at the time, but you know, people can see that and people laugh it often, you know, and people are ridiculed for it. You know, whereas if people if they see something, you know, take a picture of it or take two or three pictures, go back to the area the following day if they want to, or go back an hour later and take a picture in the same area and see can they pinpoint what was there and if it's not there then you know, yeah. and narrow it down. Yes, narrow, narrow it down. It's the same with sightings when people get, oh, I saw a Sasquatch standing by a tree or running away and people don't go back and reevaluate the area and you know, to, to get a size measurement or, and anything like that. Yeah. And I, I think that's one, one thing that we did very well when we were doing our research for the new documentary is we went back to the areas and we, yeah. we, we really went to town on on it, you know, and it, that only, it stands to you, you know, yes, that, kind of, course, yeah. that yeah. kind of research, you know, but, yeah. but hopefully we can, uh, we can push on and we'll get more success throughout the year. Yeah, indeed, Ron, thanks very much for coming on the show. Uh, as I said, we're moving on. Uh, we have plans for a part three of the documentary. Uh, we're just getting uh, things ready and sorted out for that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, part two, as Ron said, is coming out uh, 
in December. It may be a little bit uh, earlier than December, but uh, that's down to uh, to the editing team and that. So uh, in the meantime, Ron, thanks very much for coming on Talk Bigfoot tonight. Uh, as I say, I'm Jim Bradley. You've been listening to uh, Ron Madden there, Vice President of the IBRO. And uh, we wish uh, Ron all the best in the future in the, in on the organization and in the research to come in the years to come. And that's a wrap, Ron. We'll, okay, so. we'll uh, let's see, stop recording. Ron is recording. How do we, no, you're recording it. I, didn't, I don't know why it's saying that. You're probably recording it. I don't think I... I